Support for Arkansas Week provided by the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, the Arkansas Times, and KUAR FM 89. And hello again, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us. Here we are at the end of another busy news year. Multiple legislative sessions with debates over hot button social issues, the reach of government in a pandemic period, the amount government should collect in taxes, and the shape of government, executive and legislative, in the decade to come. Business. The continuing COVID impact, the continuing rise of Northwest Arkansas, the continual quest for infrastructure improvement. A lot to unpack in our year in retrospective, so let's begin. Here's Andrew DeMillo, State Capitol Bureau Chief of the Associated Press, Heather Yates, Associate Professor of Political Science at UCA. Lance Turner is editor of Arkansas Business, and welcome all. Andrew, let's start with you. The, uh, one of the big stories, at the Capitol anyway, we've got tax cuts, but one of the bigger stories, I think, is the continuing tension between the, the executive and the legislative, both of the same party. Yeah, that's, that's correct. You know, this is a theme that we have seen throughout the year with the legislature uh, during you know, legislative sessions and during this special session most recently where uh, there's uh, there's tension, even though it's a majority Republican legislature and a Republican governor, uh, there is uh, uh, some tension over how much power the uh, the legislature has. Uh, and the uh, special session, you know, really, you know, really um, there was uh, there was some resistance uh, this time around to trying to expand the legislature's power to expand the agenda and the scope of the, of the uh, special session. And the um, legislative leaders and the governor were able to head that off. Uh, but there, there was a push to try to go beyond tax cuts and really open up the session to other issues, kind of a laundry list of issues for conservatives, including a uh, Texas style abortion ban, a uh, critical race theory ban, uh, you know, even revisiting the whole issue of uh, you know, vi uh, virus mandates uh, by uh, by businesses, and uh, you know they were able to keep the special session within three days. But I think this is a theme that we've seen throughout the year, and we're we're going to see next year heading into the fiscal session just a couple months away. Right, and and throughout his tenure, Mr. Uh, Mr. Hutchinson has generally prevailed, although he has had to surrender some authority, some executive authority, to the General Assembly. Yeah, that's that's correct. You know, we we saw this uh, during the regular session. Uh, you know, there was uh, you know kind of a changing of the of the uh, power structure when it comes to emergencies, and this was really a response to uh, some uh, pushback from legislature uh, from legislators from Republican legislators over some of the uh, safety restrictions that the state had. Uh, Taken because uh, because of the coronavirus, uh, where the legislature has a bigger say in the emergency powers and in the restrictions that that can be taken, uh, not just during COVID but during future emergencies as well. Yeah, Heather Yates, you've been watching the redistricting process, the reapportionment process, and of course the social agenda of some members of the General Assembly in terms of legislation. Uh, these, as Andrew has noted, these aren't go these are not going to end with December the 31st. They're going to carry over into the next year and possibly even beyond. Do you see that? I do. Um, the special session that was called um, is important for not what it actually got accomplished, but what it threatened to do, because it telegraphed the coming attractions for the session of 2022. It's an election year, and we have a lot of state legislators who have ambitions beyond the legislature. And so they also are wanting to put um, on that agenda pieces of legislation that are going to drive topics that are going to play to the base of the party, um, even insofar as that they um, characterized Asa Hutchinson as um, being a, a moderate um, Republican, as if that's a, a, a bad thing, but notably that they were characterizing the governor as somebody who is not taking the threats to Arkansas's social culture seriously, um, of all the topics that have been previously uh, mentioned by one of the panelists here. So that's going to play out in 2022, that they've already kind of flashed their hand on what their agenda was. Um, they 
they threatened to kind of wrestle that special session away from the governor. The governor tried to preempt that as much as possible, even in his call for the special session. Um, I think the legislators and the le leadership most definitely knew that um, getting into those topics on a special session at the end of the year um, was going to be a miscalculation because it was those issues are going to, to be controversial. They are going to take time. They are going to be high profile. So that's going to carry over into 2022. And those are the things that we can most definitely expect at the top of the election year. Have, having looked at the reapportionment, Heather, and studied some of the candidates who have announced thus far for uh, for the 22 elections. Do you see the ideological temperature uh, shifting at all, uh, the scale shifting at all? Uh, in the next General Assembly, not, not, not the session that's about to begin, but in the near future. In the near future, in terms of how the ideological temperature is playing out in Arkansas, um, that has an arc linked directly to how these districts were redrawn, we see that the temperature is actually elevating, right? That these districts were drawn in a way that intensifies the Republican incumbency advantage, which is a pretty hefty advantage. And this year, the year 2021, was the year of redistricting for the state, reapportionment. And what we saw is the state legislature having a supermajority of Republicans controlled this process for the first time since Reconstruction. And that's pretty significant, significant to consider that this drives um, the, Fed, at least at the federal level, um, the, the districts for the next decade. And we see that the second congressional district was gerrymandered in a very specific way with almost surgical precision um, of southeast Little Rock, north Little Rock, got trifurcated. And so what we saw is the legislature, okay, um, really didn't have to redraw the maps of 2010, but they did anyway. And the reason why was because they wanted to hamstring any opposition that would come into that second congressional district. Because looking at Arkansas, the second congressional district was the one district that was garnering a lot of competition and becoming increasingly competitive. So what we saw here is the Republican legislature for the next 10 years, take control of a process, double down on this ideologically ideologically driven fever that we have right now that is actually upping the divisive temperature within the state. If it is Sunday morning, it's Asa Hutchinson morning. Uh, he's a regular. As become, he's obviously playing a long game here. Does anyone have what? Andrew, back to you for a second. What's going on? Well, you know, the governor has had an increased profile this year. Um, a good part of it is because he took over as chairman of National Governors Association, which made him a uh, higher profile to talk about states' issues. But also, he has kind of carved out uh, a position for himself as someone who is distancing himself from, uh, you know, from uh, from President Trump and also from, you know, somewhat Arkansas's uh, Trumpian turn, uh, where you know he's talked about you know trying to not to relitigate. Uh, the election of uh, of 2020 and trying to focus on uh, focus on the issues. The thing that's unclear is what's he going to do when when he leaves office. You know, is this part of ramping up for something bigger? He you know, he he has made it clear that he you know he has you know decades of public service and he's made it clear he still wants to do something. The big question is what exactly is that thing going to be? Yeah, Lance Turner. Uh, uh, Mr. Hutchins made a speech uh, in 2016 for Mr. Trump. Mr. Trump has turned around uh, and in his tenure. He made life miserable for Mr. Hutchinson on the business side. Uh, it, it, what's to do there? Well, I don't know. You know, it does appear that, you know, Asa Hutchinson has been a very business friendly governor here in Arkansas. I think uh, I think by and large, the business community is pretty satisfied with what he's been able to do. Uh, you know, he's been focused uh, since day one on economic development issues, you know, trying to attract and grow businesses here. And he's got a pretty good record, I think, to point to in that regard. Uh, so uh, from a business standpoint, he's very much kind of that old school mainstream Republican uh, business friendly uh, person, but those seem to be in short supply. But I think perhaps, you know, maybe there's the sense on his part that there is still a path for that kind of person in, uh, in, in government service. And, and perhaps that's where he's sort of, um, kind of trying to chart his path. 
Um, but but it's hard to imagine, given just the politicization that we've seen now, just the extremes on all sides, um, that you know someone like that can find much purchase in the electorate. That is, you know, because of redistricting and 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 how how districts have changed and become more extreme. How you can how you can appeal to a base that uh, that would that would get you elected to anything in, in that regard. Yeah, uh, some of us, Andrew, I think, are old enough to remember when uh, uh, Mike Huckabee was governor. Often in legislative sessions, Democrats were his his strongest allies. He was at war. I hate to say at war, but there was a significant tension between Mr. Huckabee and the Republican members of of the General Assembly as well, because Mr. Hutchinson Hutchinson, Mr. Huckabee was trying to steer that that middle path, trying to be a Main Street Republican. Yeah, and yeah, I think we saw this on you know several issues, especially when it came to some of the culture wars issues. Yeah, and you know, Hutchinson is still you know, by most by most measures not he's not a moderate. You know, he has signed you know a large number of of abortion restrictions, and um, but he's still kind of tried to tap the brakes somewhat on a lot of these culture wars bills. Uh, you know, most notably, he vetoed legislation that uh, to uh, ban gender affirming surgery. For transgender youth, and uh, you know he, he was uh, he was overridden on that on that veto, but you know made a point of saying you know why he thought this went too far. He still signed other uh, other measures, uh, you know culture wars measures, uh, and but there's still some areas where he's kind of you know tried tried to uh, slow down some of the, some of these things, and this is where he he's facing a lot of uh, a lot of the pushback, but also on on the virus response, you know he. That, you know, had had supported some restrictions uh, in response to COVID, and you know he's tried you know tried to kind of push back a little bit on the efforts to try to restrict what businesses can do, uh, you know, and that's where you know he's he's seeing a lot of the fight a lot of the fight right now, um, but it's not as though he is split you know in a huge way from Republican orthodoxy, uh, it's just that he you know has. You know, being painted as as a moderate for not you know being in lockstep on 100 percent on some of these issues. Yeah, uh, and Lance Turner, Mr. Hutchinson has often argued against such legislation as we've been discussing because he says it's not very good for business. That's right. Yeah, I mean, you you've got to remember you've got companies like Walmart, uh, Tyson Foods, um, other companies here in Arkansas that are big companies that are global companies that have to think about things like. Uh, recruitment and and hiring the best and brightest of people from all walks of life and attracting them to come to Arkansas and live in Arkansas uh, and do business here and so um, you know in in that regard you don't necessarily want to alienate <laughs> uh, very many groups um, and so that's been a point of tension too because you've got retailers like Walmart that want to show an inclusive face. Uh, to the world and to its workforce. And so when you've had things like uh, transgender issues come up, the bathroom bill from uh, several years ago came up and Walmart was a big voice in that. Uh, you know, LGBTQ issues, those kinds of things. Uh, when those issues have come up, uh, Hutchinson has been, I think, very mindful of where Walmart and Tyson, some of these global giants that are in our backyard, what their interests are uh, in in sort of uh, being able to, to you know, attract the best workers because they are in highly competitive uh, industries. Yeah, walking that fine line, Mr. Hutchinson said, I'm for vaccination, I'm for masking, but I don't want to order business to do it. Exactly. Yeah. And that's that's been a key thing, too. But but, you know, you've seen businesses like Tyson Foods that have gone ahead and mandated uh, uh, the vaccine on their own. And I think that's the preferred path. Right. Let businesses decide what's best for them. Um, and we will try to encourage the behavior that we want to see. Uh, but we will not have the government do that uh, you know, they, for us. In terms of big business, Lance, in Arkansas, it wasn't a bad year. Uh, it wasn't a bad year at all. No, we've had a lot of uh, activity. Um, uh, we've had a lot of, you know, like you know, the economy has awoken, right, in, in many ways. We had a shutdown in 2020, a very sudden shutdown. And I think we've all kind of underestimated exactly what that means for an economy when everything just stops. And then that's what happened. Everything just stopped. Uh, and now that demand is returning. Uh, and so businesses are capitalizing on that. And it's been awkward in a lot of ways. Uh, we're seeing supply chain delays because of that. Uh, but um, other places are doing quite well in banking. We've seen merger activity begin again. 
uh, and two of Arkansas's biggest banks, Home Bank Shares of Conway and Simmons First National Bank of Pine Bluff, have capitalized on that and, and, and bid off some big acquisitions in the state of Texas, uh, acquisitions that are adding billions of dollars of assets and expanding their footprint, uh, you know, preparing for all this demand that's about to get going again and is already underway. Um, so it's, yeah, it's frankly, it's been a, a pretty good year for business. There are a lot of unknowns, obviously, uh, but I think we're starting to try to live with those unknowns, unknowns about uh, resurgence of COVID variants um, and those kinds of things. I think we're starting to kind of pick out a path uh, of what, what this new normal is and, and be able to kind of do business around those unknowns. Well, the, the new normal, is that, uh, does, is that going to include persistent employment issues? I mean, personnel issues. That is one of the headaches that, uh, that I know businessmen, both big and small, are having to deal with. That's the number one thing that we hear almost on a daily basis at Arkansas Business from our readers uh, is, is that they cannot find workers. Um, and so, you know, this, this pandemic, I think, is, has, again, everything shut down and gave a lot of people time off, for better or for worse. And a lot of people are rethinking what they want their careers to be. Um, and that's caused... Um, you know, people to not necessarily jump at the first thing that comes along. And that's been particularly tough on the hospitality industry, restaurants, hotels, uh, you know, hourly workers really rethinking kind of what they want to do with themselves. They've been able to do this because they've had the luxury of, of, uh, of some government aid that they've been able to sort of uh, live on for a little while. There's some security there, right? It's bought them some time to kind of think through how they want their careers to be. And so that's played a role in in um, in this worker shortage, uh, but also just the sheer demand that everyone is experiencing too. I mean, we've we've suddenly got uh, you know people trying to get back out and spend money and order products, and so all that's coming back you know two, three, four times uh, more than that what we experienced last year, um, and uh, and there's just not enough people around to, to to feed that demand. So I think, you know, certainly going into next year, we're still going to be experiencing some labor pains and that's going to cause all the things that we're experiencing now. There's going to be inflation. Uh, things are going to be a little bit more expensive. And certainly I think into the first half of the year, we're going to be looking at, you know, some supply chain delays. You know, we may be getting some Christmas gifts in January because of all this. Uh, <laughs> oh, maybe, think. yeah, maybe February. Well, Lance, you hit my segue Perhaps. word there and that was inflation. Uh, that's an economic story, but it's always a political story as well. And and uh, the Fed is beginning to say, well, maybe maybe it's a little bit more than just temporary. So that's going to have an enormous impact in the, over the next 12 months, depending on the that's R. That's right. Yeah. I think we're about to see the word transitory disappear from the next uh, yeah. several Fed statements that we see. That's been the line for a while. Uh, there's a lot of pressure, I think, on the Fed uh, to, to stop um, to stop the uh, the, you know, the low interest rates to kind of take their foot off the gas a little bit and let things kind of catch up with the rest of the economy. Uh, so they've already signaled that that's going to begin happening in, in the next year. Uh, certainly, this is not good for the Biden administration at all. Um, you know, they do not like to see prices going up. Um, the, you know, the gas prices have been a pain. Those have started to ease a bit in, in, in the last few weeks. Um, so um, whatever can happen in that regard to get inflation down is, is, is good for Democrats. Uh, but again, you know, as long as it's hard to find workers and as long as it's hard to get stuff, uh, those prices are going to remain elevated for a little while. All right. Heather and Andrew and Lance as well. Uh, the year was notable in that, at least in terms of the Republican gubernatorial nomination, it looks like a clear shot for Ms. Sanders. Heather? Yeah, so heading into the gubernatorial election year, um, all of the Republican challengers that were primarying um, Sarah Sanders have dropped out. And so um, it, it's she is the candidate uh, presumptive and um, presumably the the next governor of Arkansas. And she stands to make history um, being the first woman Republican elected to that post in Arkansas ever. Um, so, yeah, that, that's going to be at the top of the ticket. But then we've also got a lot of uncompetitive um, races down ballot for all of the constitutional offices as well as the state legislature. Yeah. Andrew, it's kind of tough to what has she got now? $188 million in her campaign? Well, I'm exaggerating a little, but I think the last report was uh, just under $12 million. Yeah, yeah, her her fundraising was, 
you know, something that's been unheard of for any race in Arkansas, you know, especially, especially in a primary. And that was one of the things that kind of helped her clear the way was just the, the numbers that came in having Trump, having Trump's endorsement in a state that is very solidly Republican, solidly went for Trump. And, uh, you know, we're not even in the election year yet. And she hasn't really had to spend to spend much of it. You know, she's run a you know, run a couple ads, uh, but we've not really seen you know the bulk of that money uh, being put to use yet. And uh, you know, it's kind of unsure you know what that's going to do in terms of races here and transforming things. You know, a lot of her attention right now has still been focused on national issues, talking about Biden and criticizing him uh, rather than Arkansas issues. Uh, and that's the big question we're facing next year is. How much can she keep doing that, you know, in in Arkansas? Is she going to start, you know, laying out more of a, you know, plan on Arkansas issues? Well, she certainly has the money to fight anything that the Democrats would conceivably throw, uh, throw at her. But Heather, how much distance, how much, how much room do the Democrats have? They don't have much room. Um, when Sanders announced her race, she entrenched her initial message in, on the ground level um, of of being the defender of Arkansas. She's planted herself as being, she said her words, the last line of defense between Arkansas and the federal government. So I think that is her anchor trying to stay on the ground in Arkansas, but it's, I, I anticipate it will serve her well to maintain a national profile with this race. Her campaign was um, nationalized before she even really officially announced. And I don't think that's going to hurt her much on the ground because a lot of Arkansans are already pushing back on Biden, pushing back on the Democrats. And on the ground, the Democrats really have not been able to build up the apparatus enough to, to wage a, a formidable opposition to her. And so she has framed the narrative for nothing more that the Democrats are just going to be responding to her message, not really actually attacking her message. Yeah. Heather Yates, Andrew DeMello, Lance Turner, thanks very much for being with us, and we'll see you in the next year. Another year gone, as is our custom, we end this year by noting the Arkansans who left the arena in the past dozen months. They are, in the main, the men and women who made news, gave us something to talk about each week. Others of them helped us cover the news. Almost certainly there are some omissions, and for that we apologize. Certainly such omissions were inadvertent. Thank you. Thank you for making Arkansas Week a part of your week. Be well, and we'll see you next year.
Support for Arkansas Week provided by the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, the Arkansas Times, and KUAR-FM 89.